Hello and welcome to Myth Makers. Myth Makers is the podcast for fantasy fans and fantasy creatives brought to you by the Oxford Centre for Fantasy. My name is Julia Colding and I'm an author but also the director of the centre. And for the second time I've been joined by Jacob Renneker who is a Tolkien fan and also a language specialist amongst many other things. And we are taking a look at the Peter Jackson films 20 years on and thinking about the script choices and what might be what mistakes were made what great choices were taken and also where the scope might be for future script writers and um, new new filmmakers and television program makers to come along and do their own version and today of course as it's the second we have reached the two towers so Jacob first of all is this one of your favourite of the films or, you know, where in the lineup is it? We've only got three to to line up. Where would you put yeah. them? Uh, it's a bit uh, like asking which of the Star Wars films you like. Both, exactly it? right. Same kind of question. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, it, I would say it might be my least favourite. But only because, but that's not there. I, I think they're, they're all for me again, I, like I mentioned last time, I see them all as just kind of like one continual story, especially since they were shot kind of continuously. So for in terms of the segments or chapters of the story, yeah, it's, I think I get more uh, out of the characters and the world with the first and the third than I do in the second. The second is traditionally the most difficult to do <laughs> well, right? It's yeah. the, the, the saggy middle, right? You have to get through. So the beginning you have the set up, you have your inciting incidents, you have all this you know, new, new things that are happening, crises, and then you still have to get to your you know, climax and resolution, but there's this big stretch in the middle that you have to do something engaging with from an audience perspective. Um, and so it's, I, I think, I think it's, I think it's good. Um, it's very, I think because of the battles, um, there uh, that sometimes seems a little long, um, could be longer. Uh, but yeah, it's, I, I'd say, yeah. So the least, Again, that's a hard, like you said. Your you least know, favorite. I mean, you're struggling to criticize something we actually really like. Right, um, yeah, exactly. I actually really enjoy watching how they cope with a really difficult thing, which is what to do with the middle section. I yeah, mean, I get yeah, a lot yeah. of enjoyment from that. I, I agree with you. It's not, I would probably rewatch the first and the third more frequently. Yeah. But there are certainly plenty of perfect moments in, yep. in the second. And some really great choices, which um, surprised me. I remember watching it for the first time, which I thought, this is really good. So before we think about the, the bigger structure, um, we're going to start with some smaller moments. First of all, uh, let's think about the casting and and the, um, the choices of language and that kind of thing in the second film. Um, we were talking a lot about how Frodo was cast um, young in Fellowship. Mm -hmm. In this film, I think most of the casting is there's less challenging casting in this. It's all pretty, pretty much on 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 the same line as the book. Though we do have, I suppose this falls into this. We do have characters popping up where they aren't in the book, mm -hmm. like Halbarad sort of rocks up to <laughs> with the, with the elves, rocks up to Helm's Deep. There are some choices like that, uh, which mean that some characters are astray so were you happy with the casting choices the new the new people of course uh, mainly the Rohan um it's uh, Bernard Hill and Miranda I've forgotten her surname um the wonderful oh, actress uh, Otto oh thank you and Kurt not Kurt <laughs> Kurt Urban is the <laughs> Carl uh anyway yeah, Carl Urban yeah, yeah for um i always said Kurt Cobain. that's someone completely different, that's um, completely different. <laughs> but also with blonde longish hair yeah and then of course there's um david oh dear i should have got my my uh faramir wenham his name is uh anyway faramir yeah up to. so what what did you think about and oh, i've always forgot worm tongue uh another great uh and, character of, of Tolkien were you happy with the choices they made I, I'm I'm very happy with them all I, I, I am also I am also I, I and it's funny that uh this was just a, a couple months ago so I'm uh 
uh, watching the X Files uh, television series, American television uh, series, um, and uh, the fellow who plays Wormtongue. I'm so sad that I forgot his name. Um, he he was in an episode uh, of the second season, first or second season of of, of X Files as a you know the the creepiest, <laughs> most sinister possible uh kind of antagonist uh and he did it was yeah so it was a it was a joy it was a joy to watch him in uh another role you got brad dorif thank you google okay. i knew yes. i was going to get that completely wrong and, and so brad, yeah so brad was was uh yeah it, it just an incredible <laughs> choice for that level of yeah kind of again the sinister sneaky sleazy just dark creepy he's yeah some sort of creature of the night <laughs> almost yeah. uh, i'm sure in real life i would love to meet him in real life um and just have a good chat with him he's um, quite funny in the in the making of because of course he had to shave off his eye eye eyebrows each time he played the part oh wow he, okay his, his uh, partner was getting quite cross because he when he went for the pickups, he'd come back looking, you know, <laughs> not not a good look, guys. If you're thinking right. of shaving off your eyebrows, um, okay. So yeah, I th I think in that case, we I don't think tonally there's much difference. I think mm -hmm. all three films they they've maintained. It's not one of these scripts where they've had like loads of writers coming in and and it doesn't fit. It it feels all part of a an overarching right. uh, trilogy. So yeah. So what about um, the perfect moments for you? Do you have any of those in the? the yeah, the one I, I can say just you know one one moment, the moment that somehow I want translated onto my tombstone is uh, Aragorn's return opening uh, the hall doors at Helm's Deep. Right when he walks in, he's he's just you know drug himself through the water and the horse you know, Brago took him up onto his back and then took him back. But then, you know, when, when he first, you know, enters uh, the hall there of Helm's Deep with that kind of slow motion, almost, you know, in half slow motion, pushing open the doors and him just, you know, striding in there is every single time. It's just this, like, I just get this, like, surge of, yeah, just like majesty and power uh, and, you know, uh, awe and not that i am any of those things but just so if somebody is stopping by my gravesite someday that they see that they might get that you know just have a nice yeah, RJ, <laughs> have can a nice i would suspect that you you're, you 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 identify and root for aragon quite quite a lot i i think i can see this i, I can understand though <laughs> I can understand. um this of course, is... that, that whole episode of him falling off the edge and being dead and coming back again is is another sort of birth death and resurrection kind of uh story and it but it's not actually from the it's book. not in the books right right right, but right. it works That's, it works i think i think i mean i i think again like i i saw before i read the books um uh two towers was the film so i saw the fellowship and then uh two towers and after two towers came out that's what really it was the end of the two towers film that really gave me the final push to dive into the books themselves um, and then my life became consumed by Tolkien after <laughs> words forever after. Um, but it was that, yeah. So, so it was, it was compelling for me and got me into a place where I wanted to learn more about those characters, but yeah, I, maybe yeah. Aragorn and with the, in talking about casting, um, just going back for a second with Aragorn there here and elsewhere, Viggo Mortensen brings a kind of softness I want to say, you know, kind of almost like a feminine energy to this king, this powerful king. So he's this really this combination of, you know, power and strength, but also this softness and care and nurture as this, you know, king healer that you do see in the book. Um, but I think he really kind of elevates that and brings out the kind of nurturing qualities of the king a little, a little more in his in his performance there that uh that i love personally and kind of is <laughs> essentially kind of my model for uh, I, I i wish that i could be aragorn as a father 
<laughs> to yeah, my, to my good, children, they could see me in that. So, yeah, yeah, it's a good aspiration. For me, one of the perfect moments in terms of camera work and and evocation of place and everything is when you first see uh, the Golden Hall, um, Medusels, and you've got uh, Erwin standing in on that very windy um, <laughs> ledge that she stands on. But it just seems a very it's almost like a perfect talking moment. The the vistas, the scope, the sense of it actually having the air. You know, it's a wild place. Yeah. That and the other thing I really like as well, um, which is a slightly odd choice, maybe it's. I love that they use the Anglo-Saxon dirge for when they bury mm. um, their, their dirge. Yeah. I think this might only be in the extended edition. I don't know. But anyway, um, that that's lovely because of course they are the anglo-saxons in this right. world right uh, sort of cross between them and the the, the hungarian riders uh, of ancient history um and so there's lots of moments there thinking let's think not forget um the journey of frodo and sam are there any mm -hmm. perfect moments for you on that because of course there is the introduction of Gollum. Yeah, yeah, you do have that. I think for me, the moments with with Frodo and Sam, my favorite moment there in Two Towers is, you know, Sam's monologue when they're around Osgiliath. Um, You've let right uh, to the end here. We, we're going right, yeah, 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 exactly. So I'm going to the end, but in terms of the moments overall, just like that, where he's talking about, right, it's like in the great stories, uh, the ones that really mattered, and he's talking about the characters living inside a story versus you know seeing the story from the outside and what what sort of difference that makes um, from a person's perspective and just like yeah so his delivery um, Sean Astin's delivery of that is just so earnest and pure and inspiring every time I see it yeah that's that's a moment just like really charges me and thinks makes me think that right in the Andrea Frodo asks him so he says you know that there's there was something that was that they were holding on to in those stories and then Frodo says you know what, what were they holding on to what are we holding on to Sam and he says that there's some good in this world Mr. Frodo and it's worth fighting for right so every single time that just you know it's it is it is inspirational uh kind of at it at its core and yeah that's for me that's one of the things that one of the moments that in re-watching these films, those are the ones that I look forward to most and get the most out of are some of those character moments. And, and the, the funeral moment also that you, that you moment that you mentioned, that was one of my other favorite moments is that entire burial scene and then the conversation oh, yeah. afterward yeah. between uh right our two kings, if you will, and the reflection on you know burying uh your children is 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 quite touching and moving. Yeah, just the, the Anglo-Saxon <laughs> dirge just kind of yeah evokes that and i think yeah i think a great uh, performance by bernard hill there talking yeah. about that uh, yeah. he, it's a very simple and stripped back scene just between him and gandalf but i think it, it feels so genuine because of course in the way the book works theodred's dead sort of happy it moves quite swiftly on um mm -hmm. and that, i think it was a really good decision to give a moment of grief yeah uh, absolutely which, because the book doesn't have that breathing space in it. Um, so one more moment, of course, is I do think that when I watched it the first time, the Andy Circus first schizophrenic um, mm -hmm. usual golem, that was just amazing <laughs> when I first saw that. I mean, it's become so parodied that we almost forget how powerful that was. Well, really well written. I mean, it's all there in the Tolkien, but the way it's chosen and put together and then performed i think is another extremely perfect moment you know one of the best scenes in the whole of the three films yeah. agreed okay any um less good moments one um, that you think Meh, okay yeah so again this is i think uh, okay look at a big picture and uh you know tolkien's own theory of uh creating worlds right of of myth making so in um, his essay on fairy stories, he talks about, um, you know, the creation of secondary worlds, right? And that um, your goal is to create a world that is internally consistent and that your mind can enter and where it relates to everything as being true within within that world itself, right? Um, so 
the moment. So he says, you know, that's the, the suspension of disbelief is one thing. He doesn't think that that's what fantasy does. Fantasy isn't just the suspension of disbelief, but rather the kind of invitation toward and fostering of an active belief in a secondary uh, fantasy world. So, um, it, so, so he says the moment that, that disbelief arises, then the spell is broken and then the magic or rather the art has failed or it was, it was his way of describing that. So for me, the moment, like the moment that that absolutely, I was taken out of this film as a, a true internally consistent world uh, was a uh, Legolas kind of skateboarding down the stairs on the, on the shield and shooting arrows. Um, I think if I would have seen that as a earlier teenager, that that might have been my favorite scene in the, That's in the, the film, problem, isn't it? It's kind of a different audience for that. It seemed right, right. So that seems, yeah. So, so I think so. That kind of like tonally, it 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 seemed a, a little bit off. Uh, I would expect, I think, given how the elves act, it, I know it didn't seem quite as dignified. I don't know what I was expecting him to do to kind of like float down the stairs and and shoot arrows instead. I don't know what the alternative is, but it wasn't. But that that was for whatever reasons, that was something that during that intense battle kind of like kind of took me out of that secondary world and said, oh, I'm watching a film, not I'm living inside this world. So for me, that's probably the biggest example of something that was a cool shot and like a fun idea, but ended up for me personally kind of taking me out of the film for a moment. Had yeah, I mean, Jackson it. does go a bit crazy about uh, Legolas, doesn't he? Because um Sometimes. <laughs> So I'd, I'd sort of put that along that moment. I agree because of the skateboarding feel of that. It does feel like a stunt. Yeah. Whereas even more absurd, but in a sense more earned is when he takes down the woman kill. Uh, yeah. the, the Olive <laughs> In the next film, I, I'm leaping That's the same sort of thing. But that's the sort of, you can see him thinking, how do I get, how do I, how do I tackle this creature? And he methodically works his way, thinking, well, I've got to do this. And so it feels, I, I don't know, there's something a bit more within the world about that. Again, yeah. it's, it's an elaborate, it's not in the book or anything, but right. um, that for me doesn't jar, even though it's ridiculous. Uh, in The Hobbit, Peter Jackson goes completely crazy. He's doing anti-physics thing where he's climbing up falling rocks uh, in the last, in the battle of that. Um yeah which really is just hanging off bats, completely, <laughs> completely <laughs> silly, basically. Yeah. So, you know, I would put that that sequence at one end and when we kill at the other end and, and the, the shield thing, yeah, okay. Somewhere I mean, there. It's kind of all like right. Like it works. I could see somebody actually doing that, yes, but I could see like me and my friends trying to do it. And I, I'm, I'm sure there's probably, uh, you know, you know, uh, hospitals, emergency rooms who <laughs> have witnessed how many children have tried reenacting that down their own stairs. Now uh, you're worried because you've got a two year old, you see. I know. Yeah. yeah. So he'll, yeah. So I have to be careful on um, which scenes or just skip past that. Um, yeah. But it, it's, it, so it was, it was fun. Like, so it, it seemed more contemporary than something that fit into that world. I mean, if we'd seen something like that happen before, or there was a real reason, like he had to get down and we saw him taking the shield and it was, if it seemed kind of like an inevitable choice uh, that he had to get down and the only way he could do that was with this, if it was set up differently, then I could see it seeming more natural. I, I, I think I, I can see a world or a way of shooting that in which he has to do this. And so I'm okay with it within the world itself. But mm -hmm. as it's shot and as it came across to me, it seemed you know, kind of gimmicky. Yeah. Uh, okay. Right, so moving on from that, we again, everybody, we're, we're doing this about something we love. Um, it's not that it's a tiny moment which we're quibbling, not not the whole arc of the film or anything. Let's think about the the way it's structured from beginning to end. I think I want to particularly mention how it starts. So, if you can cast your mind back to two thousand and one, I think it was when it came out. Was it two thousand one? Something somewhere around there. Um, I think that choosing to start with rerunning the Balrog um, scene, but flipping it to Gandalf's perspective was genius. Mm. It was so unexpected, but also um, 
a sort of a, instead of doing a reprise, it's this is the important moment. This is the moment moment that's haunted Frodo. It was it was very clever. So I love that. It's one of my favourite openings. Actually, it's, it is my favourite opening of all the three films. It's the one that yeah. I think is the best bit of um, filmmaking. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And the the so the cinematography during that section, right? So you're hearing the noises of the battle as you're getting this big kind of like panoramic, you know, sweeping shot of these, you know, snow covered mountains. And you're, you're being set up with, you know, a sense, the scope of this film and what's happening. You're immediately stepping into this wide world and then you're hearing the conflict. And so it's giving you a chance to like ramp up to remember it. You're almost being primed to remember it. And then you actually get in there, um, you know, zooming in, closing in and then getting in inside the mountain. And looking at that, yeah, it's 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 beautiful. It's a great, yeah, a, a, a very powerful way to start the film with doing a small recap, like you said, to get what's the minimum amount that you have to do to get people up to speed to get into the film. And I think that was a yeah a, a brilliant uh, decision and way of doing that. It was very effective, I felt. So, in terms of the structure, they have the problem that Frodo and Sam's journey is quite unrelentingly miserable there's a brief brief spell with faramir in the books where things look up for a little bit but it is lots of rocky or ashy or swampy landscapes muted tones lots of suffering and either three actors or two so very intense so they've got two films to, well one and a half more films to do this and it, I think it's a, it's really tough. It's tough in the books. I mean, I love those bits because I always think that the the real real adventure is 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 the mental struggle, the journey that's going on, and the way that their relationship changes and shifts. So, it is it? I think I find it fascinating. But I know that my own children, for example, they much prefer the Pippin and Merry, and you know, the colourful fighting, the 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 travel you know the, the other the other stories but of course those stories are actually just settings to in, allow Frodo and Sam to inch slowly to their destination right it does present a problem because how do you make Frodo and Sam as interesting so people aren't skipping how do you do that and did they succeed yeah I think I I think so yeah I think uh, visually you're right that you definitely are distinctively seeing different environments there. Um, and yeah, so the, of course the introduction of Gollum there is really, I think what helps you keep those two worlds separate and engaging and entertaining. Um, the tensions that are created there that are, you know, that are kind of slightly different than the books uh, in terms of kind of your triangular relationship between Gollum, Frodo and Sam. Um, because Gollum, I think, I think the two towers actually it keeps closer to the book. We haven't got to return the king; it, it diverges a lot there. Mm. So, but there is already tension in the books between Frodo having empathy for mm -hmm. um, Gollum. Gollum, and I think from from this, and I think yeah. So maybe to clarify what I think in the the films, I had greater empathy for Gollum in the films and how they set. Gollum up and I think in part is the character design right so he's uh you know he looks sad and sorry and he has giant eyes <laughs> so, that, right. <laughs> so, uh, so right and in the in Andy Serkis's incredible performance uh of Gollum and then you see and again like you're saying with the the dialogue or it's it's yeah. I don't know what you call a monologue <laughs> with yourself where you're actually two distinct personalities a mono dialogue <laughs> um internal dialogue um but he's you know that going back and forth the the seeing uh Gollum and 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 in Elijah Woods uh Frodo you just like being able to tell by looking at him his pity for mm. Gollum I think I picked up on that more so in the films it was easier for me to see visually um and I got a greater feel for that than in the books uh how it's described yeah, I, I felt like it came across more. And I think, again, I think perhaps that might just because film is a visual medium and it's easier for me to respond and react to something that I'm seeing that looks like me actually visually in front of my eyes. So 
but yeah, I, I think I absolutely agree with you that uh, that Gollum talking to himself, Andy Serkis's performance just really elevated that character of of Gollum. And I think that's what is interesting. I think helps carry the Sam and Frodo parts more is is the is that element. I mean, the other thing to mention, of course, is that the books um, do the first half, book three in Tolkien's count, which is the first half of the two towers, is all the other characters. And book four is Frodo and Sam. And so what they've done is they've chopped it all up and then put it back in more or less sequential order, though I think perhaps um, the the point they finish a little bit early um, just because the way Tolkien's written it, the point at which the two, uh, I'm going a bit on, going on too long, but basically they've changed the timings so that the stories run together at, on the same timeline, whereas Tolkien sort of did, a, here's a bit of this story, here's a bit of that story, um, and I think that helps by putting it one after the other because you are then having the thing where you've got one kind of tone and palette and colour and then you swap mm -hmm. back to that and then you never forget Frodo and Sam. So that was a good choice. Yeah, agreed. Okay, so we've got some new um, characters, to, well, cultures really, to mention. Um, we've already started talking about Rohan. Were you happy with the way that was realized um in particularly i think looking at the big three erwin emma and theoden the way they were characterized there are some interesting um your discussion about magic in our previous podcast the way they explained the theoden's possession i think was an interesting change yeah, 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 absolutely. No, agreed. And that was, you know, one of those other visual elements that took me out momentarily was, you know, Theoden's kind of transformation from this, you know, hoary, white bearded, you know, almost like father time, uh, grumpy father time figure to then, you know, his beard kind of shortens <laughs> magically and, you know, his, his uh, hair color changes. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think they're, they're the depictions of them they they all give powerful performances um yeah uh Aemir, right uh in, in his you know sadness and the tragedy of him kind of being exiled uh in a sense there was really um really effect effective affective uh for for me and then uh Eowyn, what she's struggling with there um the slight change in Eowyn in her in, in regards to her relationship with Aragorn that's something we'll probably talk more about is kind of the a little shift in um what the emphasis is that the the screenwriters chose to kind of highlight and elaborate on maybe uh, a little more um that was something that from the film again just reading or not reading the books until after I'd seen the two towers um it seemed consistent and and, and made sense but now yeah going and looking at the uh uh the source material and being more familiar with that then you do lose something in you know in, in emphasizing the particular aspect of aon namely her kind of wholehearted uh, obs I don't know, obsession <laughs> or devotion to aragorn is um you, lo you lose a little bit more of this you know incredibly powerful uh, kind of independent uh, spirit that uh, wins arguments and <laughs> is a force uh, to be reckoned with in her own right. I think you lose a bit of that sense by kind of tying her um, sense of self to Aragorn so much in the film. She does have, you know, she does fall for him. She falls for what he represents. But I think that they try to give her a bit more airtime um, yeah. by putting in some extra scenes. And there's a moment where she's complaining um, in Helm Steep, for example, which I think is a, an addition because she wasn't there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I know what you mean. I think they met, she feels, um, she, she, yeah, she, she feels less dutiful in, in a way. I mean, mm -hmm. she, yeah, I think, but I, I don't mind it. I think they're, they're looking for areas to expand her character, aren't they? Mm -hmm. yep, and it yep. also it goes to your point that you made in the last podcast about when there is an opportunity to 
conflate two characters to do one job, then do so. So the situation where Ermir is sent away, um, that doesn't happen. He's not the one who's sent away. He's at Helm's Deep. And it's actually Halbarad who, not Halbarad, um, uh, Erkenbrand. Sorry, I'm getting the names right. right. Who comes, uh, and, and he's a, you, you're probably thinking, who who on earth is he? Uh, he's right. just another, the world of Tolkien is bigger. There are people you never meet <laughs> right. uh, in the films who appear there. So that was all a good choice to give that story to Ermir. Though he does come across as being a little bit churlish uh, at times. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, it's fine. That's, a, that's an interpretation. What about, so yeah, we're, we're mainly thumbs up for Rohan. Uh, they yeah. do look a bit in. I think Bernard Hill makes a crack in the uh, extended edition. I think it's him about how his armor is so much better than everybody else's. <laughs> 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 they do look quite poor and impoverished, but I suppose an Anglo Saxon um, village would have been like that, maybe. Yeah, you know, right. Your king would have had all the, the gold leaf. <laughs> um, what about the Ents? Is Treebeard uh, your Treebeard? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Again, so it was, uh, you know, it took me a while to place the voice, right? John Reese davies does yeah. the voice of Treebeard as well. So hearing that, I was like, I know, that was one thing that was somewhat distracting because I know I've heard this voice before. I know I've heard this voice before. And then again, going back to my uh, being raised half on Star Wars, half on Indiana Jones was uh, yeah, hearing John Reese davies voice, and then placing that, um, but she has a great, he has a great voice uh, for it. Um, yeah, the character design, I really like the character, the character design, especially like right when you have your um, uh, Ent moot, right, with where you have all of the different uh, Ents gathering together, visually depicting different types of trees, you know, kind of mm -hmm. almost having like one emissary from a different type of, of tree, different species of tree um, together. So I, I, I really liked what they what they did there. Um, in terms of his uh, attitude, demeanor, I think, you know, um, as I mentioned in the last podcast, uh, Tolkien's way of writing about nature is, you know, transcendental uh, in a sense, right? Uh, it's so his descriptions of the forests and tree beard, his kind of depiction embodiment of trees. You can tell this is a man who loved trees, that Tolkien loved trees, right? And so it's just a joy to see him give a tree a chance to speak. And so, <laughs> and with that, uh, it, th there's this sense of, right, the, this, this wisdom and knowledge that comes from a long life and living life slowly uh, which is more kind of aligned on the hobbit end of things right hobbits live their lives slowly right so they're kind of closer to trees and how they experience the world um it seems in a sense than the world of of you know, men and elves well el elves have you know again this impossibly long lifespan but especially with 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 men that they're kind of like action oriented and they have this kind of small scope of of vision um and what's happening and what they're concerned with Whereas the elves have this kind of long institutional history that they've lived through, um, so I didn't get that sense of wisdom from Treebeard in the film. Is what all that is to say <laughs> is that I think yeah that, that that was one of the biggest differences I saw was the that he's almost because of how slow he is he seems slow in every sense of the word <laughs> mentally yeah, well, that, and physically I, yeah. That's a change which I think isn't for the best, which is in the book, Treebeard has already pretty much decided that they need to do something. But um, how that would run in a film is Treebeard takes them to a meeting, they wait out, out outside for a long time, and then they decide to go and do something about it. So they've added in the jeopardy um, of them deciding not to act. Right. And it takes right. um, Merry and Pippin to... Um, challenge them and then to bring them to confront them with the damage that uh saruman's been doing that's a change and mm -hmm. it means that treebeard is less you know treebeard knows he knows he knows what needs to be done uh and he's talked to gandalf so the decision is, pr is pretty much from his point of view taken um so he's he's not the book tree beard he's he's a perfectly decent film tree beard but i think right. if, if you're thinking you're listening to this and you've only seen the films i would definitely have a look at how the ents behave in the Absolutely. book it's very interesting and the differences as a, as a great um extra ent who you meet the young one quick beam 
and you know what I do like is um the way they all storm Isengard mm -hmm. I thought how are they going to do this it's just like an impossible thing to realize but I think that was very well realized yeah with all the set pieces of uh breaking the the dam and and how would a tree take on a a building you know right. <laughs> it's, it, i think they did a, a smashing job on that very good okay so the final um piece i want to look at in two towers is faramir and the little uh trip to osgiliath that doesn't happen in the books folks mm -hmm. um what happens in the books is frodo and sam are taken to um the the cave where the waterfall is and that's where the the confrontation with Faramir happens, and Faramir is much much nicer in the book than he is in the film. I have a couple of problems in the film. He is shown as condoning beating up Gollum, mm -hmm. and he's also drags them off to Gondor. He he wants to take the ring. Now in the book, the point is Faramir doesn't. He refuses, you know, it's they've changed that journey, and that's a really big change. It's done script purposes to again add a bit of drama and tension. They they need an antagonist at this point. So, okay, here's Faramir. Um, it's not much of a story if he's just a nice guy who helps them on the way. Um, they have to give him a bit of edge, but it means that he's wrenched out of his it's not consistent with the Faramir you then meet again because they've done this to him. So I have a problem with that. Uh, in the, I think it's really unfair to <laughs> Faramir <laughs> that he has this sort of pro torture little moment in his right. life. Right. Yeah. No. Agreed. And I think that's you're right that that that's for you know screenwriting purposes the uh, changes in in Faramir do help create you know kind of this triangle between Denethor, Boromir, and Faramir. Right. So you have that kind of triad. Where, you're, where Denethor is kind of pitting Boromir against Faramir. Um, so it heightens the tension and drama there. Um, but you also have, in, in at the same time, trying to give Faramir a character arc, right? So that's another thing with all of these different characters. They feel like they have to have an arc. So with Aragorn, mm -hmm. um, we talked about a little bit last time, uh, you know, he's kind of this unassuming king. As we've actually seen in the first film that he... You know, or you know, Elrond says that he's turned away from that path, right? The path of, of kingship, and that he's is 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 hesitant, or if not, you know, waffling on whether or not to actually be king. If that's something he notes as he notes as his right, but is that something that he wants to do that he should do? Um, I think they do that. You definitely see that more in the films than in the books. Um, and then part of that is to create a character arc for him, right? So you need a character arc for every one of these main characters. They has to be, and you have to make it the largest arc possible to make it as compelling for yeah. audiences to yeah. follow, right? So Faramir, if you just have him as, you know, this kind of paragon of virtue and loyalty um, and justice, then you you don't get as much an arc for him as a character. You get him as kind of a static character, which isn't as engaging. And so if you want him to have more screen screen time, he has to be making some sort of change across scenes. And so here, yeah, I think I think that's part of the purpose. So you, there's definitely a different feel for the character in the book as opposed to the film. And sometimes where I think you understand a bit more in villainizing Denethor, right? So Denethor, instead of coming across in the books as just kind of a resigned kind of cold leader who has to who does what's necessary recognizes that he there that he has to face a loss and then it's kind of managing that loss as opposed to kind of an actively evil you know almost villainous um kind of bent here in the in the films in doing that you're you know he, that character kind of almost elicits that it seems from Faramir um that the fair mayor if he, he he has to live up to this particular version of his father yeah the there's a good extra scene father. with um the the original time they take osgiliath with boromir doing a speech and then the brothers together uh and then the father comes along it's, it's a very good extra scene sort of establishing that trio i mm -hmm. like that very much that scene i i just wish they hadn't done the beating up of gollum 
It yeah. just felt and that really... plays differently now too, as well. So then looking at that 20 years later with, you know, the discussion, you know, public discussions about torture, right? Military torture and, and its yeah. place or not, or, you know, the, the ethics of that, um, uh, in, in interrogation. So that, that's, that, uh, yeah, that definitely reads differently now than it did. And it did, and it read, and it read, you know, uh, shocking and, uh, yeah, and, and wrong, I think at the time, but even more so now as the world and the conversations that we're having today have, have changed, um, in our emphasis, I think seeing that scene, yeah, is definitely, you're seeing that as, you know, an analog almost for police brutality, that yeah. exists, right? And is it a serious problem? And so that does certainly the the extra, you know, the, the sort of conversations that we're having in terms of what's happening in the world today, it's impossible to divorce that from our experience watching these films. And so he hasn't now, done somebody... anything wrong at that point. I mean, I know, he has right? done yeah. things wrong in, in the past, but as far as Faramir knows, he's just being roughed up because he looks a bit. Okay. Yeah, because of how he looks. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Or, or he is, he's visited that pool, right. That he said that they established in the film that this is this pool that the, you know, the, the, the it's consequence he... is death. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Sorry. So there yeah. is, so you do have at least some justification, you know, you know, you're set up in the film of, of this is an important, they don't describe why, right. It's some sort of sacred pool. And that if you enter and take something out of it, right? That if you're if you're there, then so just keep a, keep days. their um, HQ secret. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, it's, so it's that thing. So it's, it's death. I think. Right. 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 So there's yeah. So that's what I think. So that that that's what provides at least there the justification for the I think for the characters, but from the audience, I think yeah, it's hard it's hard to buy in or be sympathetic <laughs> toward him standing there watching this poor little frail creature with huge eyes get pummeled yeah so there we go um this is the the scene um future script writers that it'd be great if you could re if you're going to give faramir a character up what would you do what what would your you know decide a different one and have mm. a go at that because we think this one is a bit of a not quite not quite hit the target there right so um again there is so much to talk about in all these films which is a lot of the pleasure of them but we've come towards the end of the two towers and we're going to leave on the cliffhanger as the film does uh, not knowing how it's all going to end so we always have a sort of little moment where we think where in all the fantasy worlds is the best place for something and we've talked about tree beard so jacob if you were a tree a sentient tree which <laughs> fantasy world would you like to find yourself in yeah, well, and I have to, you know, bracket Middle Earth for that. So this is outside of Middle Earth, just because how okay, Tolkien obviously, describes obviously it. Okay, because you'd be in Middle Earth, yeah. Otherwise. I would be, I would absolutely be there in the Middle Earth as Tolkien himself describes it. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, I think um, it's not, so it's 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 somewhat fantasy um, or it's, it's kind of borderline fantasy with magical realism. Um, have you read uh, Monster Calls? Mm by patrick ness yeah based on uh, the out uh, concept mm. exactly yeah 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 so so um uh the tree there are kind of the 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 monster the titular monster in a monster calls that yew tree uh that landscape and what what he does um and for those of you who haven't read i highly recommend it and especially the uh the original illustrated version uh, illustrated by jim k has some gorgeous illustrations that really add to this. Um, it's a, essentially a story about, uh, right, the power of uh, stories to help us understand our lives and to cope with tragedy and loss, right? Um, so deeply moving story, uh, but it's facilitated by this yew tree who tells a series of stories to this child who's coming to terms with uh, you know, his mother's uh, terminal cancer. Um, and so just how, and the, the, I, I loved the book and then the film, I don't know if you've seen the film adaptation of yeah. you know, Monster Calls. It's, it's well worth seeing. It's written by, um, Patrick Ness. He does the screenplay and there's some elements that he adds that kind of amplify the story from the book that he adds to the screenplay. So it's, it's a really interesting example of a book that's great and an adaptation that is, that is at least as good as the book in part because the author of the book is also the author of the screenplay, but this, the, the way that this, this character is depicted, Liam Neeson voices uh, the tree. So you have, uh, I don't know if it's kind of secondhand Aslan 
uh, vibes that kind of are coming through uh, from visual depictions of uh, animated characters, but Liam Neeson's depiction of this tree and this wisdom that this tree has in being kind of harsh, but also loving, right? Kind of being firm in a world where trees can interact with little boys and help them through difficult times. I think that's something that is compelling to me again, perhaps because I have a, 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 a little boy of my own that uh, <laughs> I would hope I could be a wise tree and impart, you know, sh share stories to help him get through uh, hard times that he will inevitably and unfortunately uh, experience in his life. How about you? Well, I, I first of all thought a little bit about Avatar, the world of the Avatar, okay. but I actually, I'm, it's not one I, I love. So my my thoughts went back to um, what I read as a child, and I don't often think about Enid Blyton anymore because um, I she'd fallen out of favour or whatever. I don't know, but um, I loved as a child the Magic Faraway Tree stories. Hmm. Now I don't know what they'd be like to read now. Um, but what I remember, this is the difference between what they could be. I have, I have no idea. Um, but what I remember is there's this massive tree with lots of people living in it, lots of little little like creatures living in it. But the best thing about it all is at the top, a different world touches the top of the tree, and it mm. moves on. So the children can climb up the tree and have an adventure, but they have to leave before the world moves on, or they get stuck. That's a bit of jeopardy mm. there. And I love the idea of this. I suppose it probably in the background there's the the tree of the world and all those sort of mythic trees is influencing that. But I I remember finding that a very powerful tree as mm -hmm. I was. Uh, I think I won't go back and read it again because I want to keep the fact that it was so amazing still in my mind. I don't want to sort of challenge that. So the magic faraway tree. I'd like to be that. Thank you so much, Jacob. And uh, I look forward to talking to you about Return of the King. So right, we Thank you so return. much for having me. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for listening to Mythmakers Podcast, brought to you by the Oxford Centre for Fantasy. Visit OxfordCentreForFantasy.org to join in the fun. Find out about our online courses, in-person stays in Oxford, plus visit our shop for great gifts. Tell a friend and subscribe wherever you find your favorite podcasts worldwide. Music